Hello, Holz champions. You may be aware that insulin resistance is at the root of most modern disease, such as diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease. But did you also know that most of what we're being told about insulin resistance is wrong. And the reason this is so disturbing is that insulin resistance is so critically important to understand. But I'll let you decide how important. Type 2 diabetes affects 500 million people in the world today, but there's two to three times that many people that have prediabetes, meaning if they don't change something dramatically, in five to ten years they'll probably be, most of them will be diabetic. So that's upwards of two billion people who have this or will get this condition. And it's the leading cause of blindness, kidney failure, and amputation. But if that wasn't bad enough, insulin resistance also is contributing or causing metabolic syndrome, which causes heart disease, stroke, hypertension, and even cancer. So we're talking probably 90% of all the things that people suffer from and die prematurely are related to insulin resistance. And it also means that the thing we spend money on, 90% of the healthcare costs are for insulin resistance and related problems. And these costs are growing so astronomical that it's becoming a burden on most economies in the world. Let's look at a few phrases I found to see if we can start understanding what they're saying and why they're saying it and what's really going on. The first phrase we want to take a look at is insulin resistance occurs when excess sugar circulates in the body. And while that's not completely wrong, it does have some problems with it when we evaluate cause and effect. Second, over time the pancreas ability to release insulin begins to decrease, which leads to the development of type 2 diabetes. And this is from medicalnewstoday.com, which was reviewed by medical professionals, PhD, registered nurse, medical doctors, etc. So what's the problem here? Well, let's try to sort out the sequence of things. First, they look at blood sugar only. They look at excess sugar and when they talk about development of type 2 diabetes they're talking about blood sugar only. They're diagnosing this with fasting blood glucose and with A1C which are measures of blood sugar. They don't look at anything else to diagnose this. So if we look at blood sugar, when we get high blood sugar the body responds with increased insulin. And now if we maintain this year after year after year, eventually the body develops insulin resistance. And make sure you stay with me all the way to the end because a lot of these pieces and a lot of these reasons will come back through this video so that in the end it will make a whole lot of sense to you. Here is what happens. When you're insulin resistant, now the cells don't want the sugar anymore. So it started with high blood sugar, but because of the insulin resistance, it causes a loop to cause further increased blood sugar and so forth. So now you're stuck in a loop and you need to do something different to break this loop. But because they only look at the blood sugar, they sort of don't ask why did this blood sugar get high in the first place? Well, that was because you ate foods on a regular basis, you ate it frequently, that caused high blood sugar, so-called high glycemic index foods. And that's basically any form of sugar or starch, carbohydrate, processed foods, etc., which is abundant today. Insulin is one thing that leads to insulin resistance, but there's one more thing, and that is when the liver gets congested, when we get a fatty liver because the liver is metabolically overwhelmed, then the liver gets insulin resistant and that contributes to the body's overall insulin resistance. And this is caused by fructose. Fructose can only be metabolized in the liver and therefore anytime we eat a significant amount that places an enormous burden on the liver, it gets congested, fatty liver and so on. And then 
this sugar which contains glucose and fructose. The glucose is a very high glycemic food and the fructose affects the liver. So this is why sugar is the absolute worst thing and probably the biggest contributor to insulin resistance and fatty liver. But then once that liver is congested, now any kind of high glycemic food, anything that raises blood sugar is going to keep us stuck in this loop. And what we find is that in most type 2 diabetes, there is no problem at all with the pancreas. And we'll talk more about this on, on another slide. But the pancreas ability to release insulin does not decrease. Most type 2 diabetics make tons of insulin but that's not the problem. If you do a Google search for insulin resistance, you find this statement. Treatment can help, but this condition can't be cured. And Google references Mayo Clinic and others. Now there's four words we have to understand to understand why they're saying this. We have to understand how they're using these words. And that's treatment, help, condition, and cure. So treatment, what does that mean? A lot of people think of treatment as massages or exercise or diet intervention, etc. But in the medical context, strictly speaking, treatment means pill, shot or surgery. All right? Then help. What does help mean? What can treatment help with? What are they talking about? They are only talking about lowering blood sugar. Type 2 diabetes to them, insulin resistance to them is the problem is high blood sugar. So help means lower blood sugar. The problem here is that when the body gets insulin resistant and you do something to lower blood sugar, the body has a reason to resist that blood sugar. And if you do something to lower that blood sugar, you increase the insulin resistance. You make the body more insulin resistant when you do the intervention from the outside. What about condition? What does that mean? Well, it's typically about a collection of signs and symptoms that indicate that something isn't working. And very often we think about something that's broken. There's an organ or a tissue that's not working the way it's supposed to. It failed because it's broken. But when I think about it, I think about an adaptation. I think about whenever you push the body in a certain direction, the body is going to respond. If you sit on the sofa all day long, your muscles will go away. If you go to the gym and work out, then your body will make more muscle. It adapts, it responds to your lifestyle. Well, blood sugar is no different. High chronic insulin levels is no different. Your body is responding, it's adapting, it's changing and shifting things, but all the pieces are still working. All the organs, everything is doing exactly what it's supposed to do under those circumstances. It's an intelligent adaptation. And when they say no cure, what do they mean by that? Well, again, they're talking about no pill, shot or surgery that will make the problem go away. But again, why won't it? Because the pill, shot or surgery, the help will lower blood sugar, but it will make the problem worse. So obviously you can't reverse insulin resistance with a treatment that's going to increase insulin resistance. What you need to do is solve the problem from the inside. You need to change the lifestyle. You need to remove those things that the body adapted to and then your body will reverse the adaptation. That's what the body does. Next point of confusion is it isn't exactly clear what causes insulin resistance. And this is from cdc.gov. Now usually the common causes that they're saying may be involved is genetics, a family history. And while there is definitely a genetic predisposition, it is also about the fact that in families we develop similar habits. Your parents eat a certain food and then they raise you on that food. And that more than anything predisposes you 
to develop whatever they had. Being sedentary is also a contributing cause, often referred to, and weight is often a contributing cause, which it is not. It is a correlation, it coexists, it doesn't cause it. There are overweight people without insulin resistance and there's insulin resistant people who are not overweight. In a lot of people, the insulin resistance causes weight, but not the other way around. But let's look at the actual thing. So you have three things. You have blood sugar, insulin, and cell that we need to understand. So the blood sugar is the glucose, it's the energy, potential energy, in the blood. Now, insulin is a communicator. Insulin stands between the cell and the blood, and it says, hey, cell, let me tell you about this blood sugar. And it introduces the idea of blood sugar, and it helps this blood sugar get into the cell. It basically sells the cell on the idea of blood sugar. And if this happens once in a while, like a couple of times a week or several times a week for certain periods of the year, like in the summer when fruit and plants are abundant, that's once in a while. And then the cell is going to be super happy and really healthy because then this blood sugar is a good idea. But what if this happens chronically? And chronic, we mean 365 days a year, six times a day, and it happens with processed foods and things that are not natural and things that we weren't normally exposed to very frequently or even at all. Now, this chronicity turns this communication into nagging. So if someone comes talk to you and you're enjoying a good conversation, then you're saying, hey, this was good, let's do it again. But if someone comes every five minutes and says the same thing over and over and over, now that is nagging. And what happens if someone is nagging? Now you become resistant. And your cell is no different. Whenever it gets overwhelmed, whenever it gets bombarded, then it starts getting resistant. And what is it becoming resistant to? The insulin. So it is absolutely perfectly clear the cause of insulin resistance is insulin. Does it matter what our genetics are and all these other things? Yes, they're variables, they're predispositions. But in the end, insulin causes insulin resistance. One thing we really want to try to clear up is how people look at this. So people go get their blood work done, they go to the doctor every year and the doctor says, nope, you don't have it, you don't have it, you have no disease, nope, you don't have it yet. And then one year, all of a sudden, you have it, you went from no disease to disease. Did that really happen? in a year? And the answer is no, but let's understand why this happens. Because they're looking at glucose and they're saying if it's 70 to 100, then you're normal. If it's over 125, you're diabetic. Then sometimes they measure A1C. This is becoming more frequent, fortunately, but it's still kind of rare. And A1C is supposed to be between 4 and 5.6. That's a healthy level. If you're over 6.5, you're diabetic. If you're between these levels, you're pre-diabetic. A1C is a measurement of how much of this glucose that sticks to your red blood cells, to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. This is called hemoglobin A1C. And a blood cell lives for about 100 days. So the Glucose is an instantaneous measurement in this moment in time, but A1C is a measurement of what happened in the last 100 days. What was your average in the last 100 days? And if you only look at these two markers, you're going to miss when the problem develops because glucose is a controlled variable and the body controls it with insulin. So what if you measure insulin? Well, now they say the normal range should be 2.6 to 25. 
right? These things have to be maintained within very narrow ranges, but insulin supposedly can vary tenfold, a thousand percent more is okay in the medical reference. So the key to understand is that glucose is a controlled variable, but the question is how hard does the body have to work to maintain that blood sugar at an ideal level? So then they created something called HOMA-IR, Homeostatic Model Assessment of Insulin Resistance. And they take a formula, they take glucose multiplied by insulin, they divide by a constant and they just pick this constant to get an ideal number to be one. So then if your number goes up to two, that means your body is working twice as hard to maintain the glucose within this level. So the reality is that it's not about no disease or disease. It's not black and white. It's a continuum. And type 2 diabetes is the full-blown manifestation of uncontrolled insulin resistance. Prediabetes means it's pretty bad, but you're not quite there yet. On the other end of the spectrum, we have good. These are people who are very insulin sensitive. That's where you want to be. And then on the way there means it's not great. You've started kind of slipping up the scale. And when we look at blood sugar, then blood sugar is controlled. So it does this. It stays the same. And then all of a sudden, when the system is finally overwhelmed, then the blood sugar goes up and you have diabetes. In reality, this is what's happening. Let's say that you start off, you're insulin sensitive, your blood sugar is 90, your insulin reading is three. Those are really good numbers. Now your A1C is probably gonna read something like 5.3. Could be a little bit less, a little bit more, but in, in the ballpark. Now your home IR, we multiply this by that, divide by the constant, we have 0.7. So you're very insulin sensitive. Now a few years go by, five, eight, 10 years. We measure your glucose again, it's the same, right? It's the same. But had we measured your insulin, we would see that it's gone up dramatically. Your A1C might have gone up a little bit because your body ultimately manages to get it back down to 90 because it's controlled, it's working really hard to do this but it takes it a little bit longer to get it down. So your average A1C is probably a little bit higher. Now we look at your HOMA IR, it's 2.0. So now we see that you're three times more insulin resistance. Your body has to work three times harder than it did back here, but the glucose is the same. We go another few years, your glucose is still 90, but now it takes 18 units of insulin, your A1C is starting to increase, and again, your HOMA IR doubled. Now, it takes four times more effort for your body to maintain that glucose level. A few more years go by, and finally, your glucose cannot be controlled anymore. You got 150, they say, oh dear, you have diabetes, look at that. And your insulin, which they don't measure, is sky high. And your A1C is gonna be above this. It could be seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 14. Once the dam breaks, there's really no controlling it anymore. And if we calculate your home IR now, it's getting astronomical because the insulin is high, but even with that high insulin, the glucose is not controlled anymore. So here's the question. We said earlier that they claimed that type 2 diabetes develops because the pancreas output is reduced, that it can't make enough insulin anymore. But if we actually measure insulin, we see that's not true. Insulin is higher than ever. But the body is intelligent and the body has to weigh the pros and cons because it knows there are damaging effects of high blood sugar and there are damaging effects of insulin. Which one do we pick? And the body could keep making more insulin, but then it would make you more and more insulin resistant. It would increase 
everything to do with metabolic syndrome such as heart disease and stroke and high blood pressure and obesity and it says it's like you push me into a corner I can't solve all these problems so it's just not going to be real pretty from here on out and I want to drive this point home one more time that Diabetes is diagnosed based on blood sugar. They measure glucose and A1C and it looks like the progression is like this red arrow when in reality the progression of insulin resistance is based on insulin which looks like this. It's pretty much linear and if we measure it then we can see where we are on the scale. Are we good? Are we not great? or are we pre-diabetic or worse? And there's a lot of confusion about the diet as well. Most often recommended insulin resistance diet is to eat low fat. They tell you to eat low fat food because it has so many calories. They tell you to eat low fat dairy. They tell you to eat lots of grain. They tell you to avoid the white bread and the sugar. They've come that far, but they say eat plenty of rice and plenty of whole wheat bread and so forth which is a terrible idea because all those things raise insulin and it's not about calories. It's not about calories making you fat and the fat causing insulin resistance. It's the insulin that causes insulin resistance. So you want to avoid the sugar and the carbohydrates, all forms of carbohydrates, not entirely but a lot of them and then you want to eat things that are satisfying and high fat because those things don't trigger much insulin. They tell you to avoid saturated fats because again there's this misconception that saturated fat is a bad fat. Well there's no evidence to that. In fact people who eat the most saturated fats turn out to be the healthiest. They are very satisfied. It's easy to reduce carbohydrates. It's easy to do intermittent fasting and reduce and reverse all your insulin resistance and your disease markers. So there's just no evidence that saturated fat would be a problem unless you eat a lot of sugar at the same time then you can't metabolize any fats properly. They tell you eat lean protein and they say avoid the beef and the lamb and all those fatty sources eat chicken and the best cut according to them is the chicken breast because it's the leanest. Well not only is it boring but chickens are not raised very well. If you find grass-fed beef or grass-fed lamb those animals had a natural life. They ate things they were supposed to eat not so with chickens. There is almost impossible to find healthy chicken, pasture raised chickens that had a healthy life. A lot of things you hear don't make much sense but this one has to take the price. Don't skip meals because that makes your insulin swing up and down. No it doesn't. Skipping a meal brings your insulin down and that's not a problem unless you're hypoglycemic and you would be hypoglycemic if you eat frequent high carb and sugar meals. So if you tried to increase and decrease and increase if you're trying to balance your blood sugar with frequent meals that is where you have these blood sugar swings. The solution is to eat things that don't cause the spike then you're not going to have the bottom out. So if you stabilize your blood sugar by eating high fat and eating saturated fats that are satiating and by avoiding the carbs and the grain and the low fat dairy and all the things they recommend. Now your blood sugar stabilizes, your insulin swings stabilize and now it's easy to skip a meal and now your insulin comes down which is a good thing. It doesn't swing up and down it comes down. That's what you want. And as if that wasn't crazy enough they added that this leads to belly fat which makes your body more likely to resist insulin. Now here they kind of have a point again with the fatty liver that we talked about that the belly fat is associated with fatty liver which is insulin resistant. It does make you more likely to resist insulin but the skipping of the meals and stabilizing blood sugar is the solution 
to that belly fat and makes you less likely to resist insulin. So if you watched the whole thing, then it should be perfectly clear by now that insulin resistance is not a disease, nothing is broken, the body is intelligent, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. When we push it, the body will adapt. And what was it that pushed it? It was sugar primarily. So what do we do? We eliminate the sugar. Carbs contributed, so we reduce carbs. The number of meals stimulate insulin. The more frequently you eat, the more frequently you stimulate insulin. So we reduce the number of meals. If you're being sedentary, then that makes you more likely to develop insulin resistance. If you're already insulin resistant, it's not going to do a whole lot, but exercise is always a good thing if you do it the right way. And I've done tons of videos on that, on how to do low stress exercise just for this. And stress is a contributing component. Stress causes cortisol. Cortisol drives blood sugar, which drives insulin. So we use ways of de-stressing, breathing exercises, meditation, etc. And as far as the official guidelines, unfortunately, the best advice I have is to do the opposite. That the clinical experience and the testimonials from millions of people say that they get the best results when they do the opposite. The only thing that you can follow along is in terms of sugar. Everyone at this point agrees sugar is a bad thing. Processed foods, that's a bad thing. And trans fats are a bad thing. Avoid those, but other than that, pretty much do the opposite of what they say. If you enjoyed this video, you'll love that one next. And if you really want to understand how the body works and learn how to master your health, then make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.